So we're going to talk about treatments now, and I'm going to go back to Dr. Galton. And uh, the reason I'm showing this is because he, as well as uh, describing CLL in detail in the 1960s, he developed chlorambucil in the 1950s. And the reason that this has got a Canadian connection is because the second person on that list is Lionel Israels. And Lionel was, our, was my, my mentor, is why I work in CLL. And uh, he had a profound effect on many, uh, many uh, people across the country. He was the director of, uh, of Cancer Care uh, Manitoba for many, many years. And uh, he brought back, when he came back to Canada, having trained in London with David Galton, he brought back chlorambucil with him in his suitcase, and he treated patients in Winnipeg in the 1950s. And we still use chlorambucil today. And I thought this was really interesting, too, because when I was reading the article, we're, we are so used to talking about remissions in our patients. But that original study, when they looked, they talked about benefit. And they actually talked about really the, eff the effect of chemotherapy on quality of life. So they were talked about benefit, and it, what they said was, we mean improvement in the real value to the patient, so as a result of treatment can return to something approaching a normal life for at least six months. I thought that was really quite amazing. Never talked about lymphocyte counts or spleen size. They talked about, did it really improve your well-being? And then an imp some effect was a lesser effect. So I th thought that was really quite remarkable. Um, and you can see in that original study, there were eight patients with CLL. So you didn't need 1,000 patients randomized to two different treatments, but eight was enough. So nowadays, we, use, uh, we have got much more, uh, much more precise definitions. And I should say that one of the problems with chlorambucil was because there were no clinical trials. I mean, all of those patients were given different doses of chlorambucil. And the problem we've had with chlorambucil is that until recently, we never knew the right dose of drug to use. Everybody gives, and even now, everybody gives chlorambucil in a different way. It comes to fludarabine, because of Dr. Keating's work, we all use it in the same way. But chlorambucil, everybody has their own favorite way of giving the drug. And this, um, so the, really this definitions of response have also changed how we develop drugs and ensure that, that we're using the right dose. And so basically here, I've just shown a pattern. I can't point, unfortunately, but this is a typical patient who gets diagnosed, the disease progresses, and then is treated and remains in remission for a while, and then there's a relapse. And the things that you, uh, we measure now, really the three main points are the depth of remission, whether you get a complete or a partial or no response. Uh, then we have what's called a progression-free survival. That is the time to treatment until you relapse. And then there's the overall survival. So I'm mentioning these because I'm going to come back and mention them later, and you probably need to know these definitions for the coming talks as well. So progression-free survival is a good measure of how long you're going to stay in remission. And the other point that has become apparent as we've developed these drugs is the deeper the remission, usually the longer the remission occurs. Um, as Dr. Keating pointed out to me, that's not always true. If you have a deletion 11, you may have a very nice remission, but you have early relapse. So not all things are true. So I've also shown here what I thought went through the sort of the evolution of therapy. And um, there were a number of major points I'm going to make. One was the development of chlorambucil, and then Dr. Keating's work with fludarabine around 1990. And then uh, the next major development was with rituximab. It made a huge difference, and that, um, that was then combined with F uh, fludarabine and cyclo, as Dr. Keating did. And then um, later on, uh, there's a bit of a gap, but then around 2013-14, there are three major advances. One advance was with uh, Ben Namustian and Rituximab, and Dr. Halleck can talk to us about the development of that regimen and as it compares to FCR. The second was with the abinutuzumab, which is the new version of Rituximab, which I'll touch on. And then uh, finally, the newer drugs, Ibrutinib, 
and adalalacid. So I want to make one point here is uh, when I was a resident and I've um, been treating CLL or focused in CLL for 30 years, when I was in training, people actually said that our treatments actually didn't do very much, that they, we, we were really treating ourselves. Um, and that was when we had chlorambucil. But this is from the Barcelona group, and they looked at survival of their patients before and after the development of fludarabine. And there was a distinct improvement in survival with the development of, with the addition of just one drug. And the benefit here was for patients who re required therapy. The patients who did not need chemotherapy had no difference in survival. It was patients who underwent treatment, which with strong evidence, I think, that fludarabine actually had an impact in survival. I want to mention now the rituximab and abinutuzumab, and what is the difference? Well, rituximab is remarkable. It's an antibody, and it coats your leukemia cells like sugar coating. And this sugar coating uh, allows the body to recognize the cancer cells as being foreign, and those cells can then be cleared by your liver or your spleen or your bone marrow. Some cells will break down in the blood and cause those reactions that many of you have had. Um, but there's another, the third mechanism is this direct kill by the rituxima. It has a direct effect on the cells, and that's why you get this great additional benefit when you add rituximab to chemotherapy. Rituximab by itself doesn't do very much, but when you give it with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, you have FCR, which is dynamite. Now, the other antibody, which is the new one, which many of you are aware of, is abinutuzumab. Now, this differs from rituximab in that it has a much greater direct effect on the cancer cells. By itself, it has a great effect. It will kill cancer cells very effectively. And part of the problem is then you get these reactions in the treatment room. You get these infusion reactions. Because it's so potent, you get breakdown of cancer cells in the blood, and you get reactions much more than you do with rituximab. Um, so you have to give it differently. You give a small amount in the first day and a larger amount in the second. But I think abinutuzumab looks really uh, a very exciting new addition. The next kind of theoretical point I want to make, and this is that as we've developed all these new treatments, we have a balancing act to follow. And this takes, um, this takes a little bit, it's a bit like cooking. You have to know, you have a recipe, but you know, have to know how to put it all together to, to make the right cake. And I think you have to be very careful. When FCR came out, for example, everybody thought that Everybody should get FCR, but you can't do that. FCR is suitable for some patients and not for others. And this is because really of fitness. And I think this is the German group have made this tremendous uh, contribution, I think, to our, uh, to our understanding by defining fitness. And so who can, is fit enough to receive one type of treatment and not another? Um, in our clinic, only about a third of patients will be able to receive, um, will be able to receive uh, FCR. Now, the question is, how do you define fitness? I, I think this is, I don't know how many of you do yoga, but this is the peacock pose, which is, which is pretty tough. And I think it's amazing that her earrings are still on. I think they, would, <laughs> they should have popped off by now. But I mean, she's, that really is remarkable. So most of us would accept that she's pretty fit. But there are uh, other ways of defining fitness, and I think I'm going to go through them because I think they're important. When you're going to go on to whatever treatment, these things have to be looked at. Your kidneys, how well they work. What you called your SIRS, which is, your, um, which is the number of illnesses you have. And most of our patients uh, have, have uh, some other problem, whether it's high blood pressure or high cholesterol, or they've got their own low sec for stomach problem. All of those things add up, and um, they are also, uh, so if you've got too many of those problems, you probably shouldn't get FCR. And the third point is your performance. If you're able, like this lady, to do the peacock, you've got a very good performance status, as opposed to somebody who comes in in a wheelchair. 
So those are the three parameters that are used, and probably you're all quite familiar with them, but I thought it was useful to emphasize. Now, I'm going to go through the standard treatments now, and I've split uh, into fit, unfit, and frail. And the frail, from our perspective in Winnipeg, are those patients who could not take or cannot take an antibody. They may have severe cardiac problems, um, or they're just very frail. And so we, if we feel that they would not s survive a trans a, an infusion reaction in the treatment room. Now, those are few in number, but they are about 5% of our patients. And for those patients, we would use chlorambucil. For the fit patients, uh, about a third of our patients, we, uh, we use FCR. But BR is now, um, is now being compared in the German randomized study with FCR, and I'll come back to that. But on balance, FCR appears to be the better regimen. And it's uh, probably because it's got a combination of the fludarabine cyclophosphamide. The bendamustine is purely what's called an alkylating agent, like chlorambucil, and, and it, you may require both fludarabine and cyclo. So you can see there that if you actually look at complete remission rate, it's higher for FCR than for BR, but the overall response rate is the same. Now, for the unfit, I think um, probably the country en masse um, is going to start using chlorambucil or um, the, it, is, it appears to be the most effective regimen, and if you look at the response rates there, um, you can see that they're better than chlorambucil and rituximab, and they're better than for chlorambucil alone. Certainly, the addition of an antibody to chlorambucil makes them much better but abinutuzumab seems to be the best. FR is the favorite uh, regimen in uh, British Columbia, and this is one of the frustrating things. Our American guests probably don't appreciate this, but treatment for, for uh, all our cancers varies across the country. It is, it is highly dependent on where you live, and the availability of drugs is highly dependent on which province you're in. So, um, that is an issue. We're actually in the process, or we are hoping to get national guidelines for CLL, which will help smooth out that problem. So if we go on now, so those are our common regimens. I'm going to summarize what I, what I feel is, is the sort of state of, of art. I think FCR appears to be better than BR probably uh, overall. Um, in younger patients, it's better tolerated if you're less than 65. And so it appears to be the preferred treatment. If you're over 65, it's probably equivalent. Um, so I think it is, it is a toss-up there of which to use. The German study now shows that BR patients who are over 65 receiving BR had less problems with marrow toxicity and less hospitalizations. So BR may be preferable. But I've, I'm just going to go back a slide. I forgot to show you the costs of these drugs. We just give chlorambucil, it's, it's about $600 for a six-month course of treatment. You add in any of these antibodies, or FCR, they're all about $50,000 for a six-month course of treatment. If you want to use BR, it's double that. It's 100000 So it's a big difference. So go back now to the, uh, to the unfit patients. Chlorambucil alone, or, or unfit or, or frail, if you l use chlorambucil alone, I talked about progression-free survival before I defined it for you. So it's about a year with chlorambucil. If you add in the rituximab, it's about 16 months, and then if you use abinutuzumab, it is 27 months. So it has a, there's a significant advantage, I think, in adding the abinutuzumab. This is just to, uh, to show you graphically um, the benefit if you're less, if this is for FCR. I think if you're less than 65, I think it's a no-brainer. You should get FCR. I think if it's over 65, it's still, we're going to have to discuss, uh, discuss it, but appear, they probably are equivalent. And this is the uh, chlorambucil of binutuzumab, and I'm really just showing here. I've shown on the left slide the, just the duration of remissions, and you can see that Chlorambucil is um, a poor cousin there. But the actual, whether any of these, uh, we, 
they are likely, the addition of the antibody is likely to prolong survival, but how much and uh, whether there's a difference with abinutizumab over rituximab is still unclear. Um, so I'm going to just, I'm almost finished, which is amazing for me because I usually talk far too long. But I'm going to, um, in the last few slides, talk about the new drugs. And we've recently had notice of compliance for um, abrutinib and adalalacib. And the abrutinib we probably use mo most of because it came out first. As uh, You can get it now on a compassionate basis, second-line therapy, or first-line therapy if you have deletion 17. And these drugs are really quite uh, remarkable. Your cancer cells cannot survive in the blood by themselves. They have to go into lymph nodes, they have to go to spleen or bone marrow, where they come in contact with other cells and they're nourished, they are protected from chemotherapy and they can divide and then come out into the blood and circulate again. And if you don't let them go into the lymph node or spleen or bone marrow, they'll die. They cannot survive in, in the blood by themselves. And so these new drugs block the binding of leukemic cells in these sites. So they immediately become unlocked or unglued, and they fall off. And this falling off causes them to die. Most of them will die actually in the lymph nodes or spleen. And then some will actually fall out of the lymph nodes and spleen and marrow and come into the blood. So what you see in the first four to six weeks is this uh, blue line, I'm colorblind, I think it's blue, um, the, uh, you'll get this increase in the lymphocyte count in four to six weeks, and then gradually over the next year, in 80% of patients, the lymphocyte count will come back down to normal. About 20% of patients, it'll stay up a bit, but that doesn't seem to matter. Those patients seem to do okay. The green line is the size of your lymph nodes and spleen, which shrink at the same time as your lymphocyte count goes up. And if you actually look at the long-term response, now you're, you're looking at sort of, this is for patients who've had lots of prior treatment, okay? So they've, this has had prior treatment, and they are receiving its second line. So the patients who do, don't do so well are those with, not everybody does great. So if you've got a deletion 17, which if you've had lots of chemotherapy, you may well have, then the chances of a relapse are at two years are about 50%. If you don't have any problems, then you can stay in remission for a prolonged period of time, and a deletion 11 is somewhere in between. So that's, the, uh, that's uh, with second line, and obviously at the less treatment you've had before, then the better you do, and that's, that's not surprising. But it's very expensive and this is going to be over $100,000 a year for life. So it is going to be a major issue. So in the last few slides, I just want to show you how, sort of to summarize what, what we, uh, our treatments are. This is in, in, in Manitoba. Our fit patients, what we are proposing is if, the, if you're fit, um, and about 30% of our patients will be in this group, if you're less than 65, we would give you FCR. If you're over 65, it's a toss-up between FCR, reduced FCR or BR, and Dr. Keating may give me some advice here. If you're less fit, um, we would use, um, probably most of our patients will get chlorambucil and obinutizumab. If you can't give chlorambucil, maybe for skin rash, it would be one cause, or you can't tolerate it, then we would give you FR. We use a lot of FR right now, um, but um, our FR in the past, now we use chlorambucil, rituximab, but as soon as abinutuzumab is available, we want to switch. And for our frail patients, which makes up about 5% of our patients, we just give chlorambucil alone. So um, if you relapse, then that's always the question, what do you do? Well, it depends when you relapse. So if you relapse um, after two or three years, then we would probably give you the same drugs again. If you, um, if you relapse earlier, we will do FISH again to see if you have a deletion 17 or not. If you have a deletion 17, we will put you onto a brutinib. If you're less than 70, we would consider you for a marrow transplant, if you're fit. Um, if you've relapsed after FCR or BR uh, within a short period of time, 
um, you're not going to respond again to any of those agents, and so we would give you a BRIC NIP. And in the, in the group in the middle there, FR versus chlorambicil, if you relapsed, we would pr probably try the other arm. If you relapsed after chlorambicil, we'd give you FR, or if you relapsed after FR, we would give you chlorambicil GA101. And the last slide I wanted to make a point is that um, it's not just the drugs you need. You need to have the right environment. This is a last slide. Is, um, it's from, I have five minutes, I'm okay. Um, this is, came from the Mayo Clinic, and I think it's a very important and insightful. It caused a bit of controversy. But what they did was that patients who attended the Mayo Clinic with CLL where either you go to the CLL clinic and you're seen by people who have a special interest in CLL, or else you go to the general hematology group who may or may not be particularly interested in CLL. And they looked, so it was 50-50, they looked at how their patients did over time. And if the patients went to a CLL-specific physician, they lived on average two years longer than those who did not. It was a big difference, and they had no good explanation as to why that was. So we've done the same thing in Manitoba. We looked at our patients, and we looked at, uh, in, in Manitoba, 50% of patients in this particular, age, this particular time attended our uh, clinic, our CLL clinic, which is a specialized clinic. It has, um, it, it's primarily research-oriented, but it's got all the people who are involved have got some research aspect both nursing and physicians. And um, the, the survival was much better in our clinic. And I don't really have a good explanation, but we did break it down by age groups. And the reason that the patients did better in our clinic was because we were able to eliminate the age factors. Our older patients who came to our clinic um, did well. They did much better than if they didn't come and they were much more likely to receive chemotherapy. Now, it may be that um, frail patients don't come to us. I'm not sure if that's the case, or whether they uh, felt that because a patient was in their 70s or 80s that they wouldn't tolerate chemotherapy, and so they didn't have that option. But one of our focuses now in Manitoba is looking at all the patients in our province to, to ensure that everybody is getting adequate care. So my summary slide is, um, in terms of, of second malignancies, please watch your skin. Don't sunbathe. You don't, don't need to burn yourselves. Um, and um, make sure that you have your surveillance for second malignancies. Um, the, this can occur even early in the disease. Uh, clearly, it's going to be a problem that will get worse as your disease progresses and your immunity diminishes. It's still a factor at all stages. Um, the, the, Im, watch your immunoglobulin levels. At some point, you may require replacement. Um, the choice of treatment um, will depend on your fitness, so make sure you understand why you're getting a particular treatment. And I think the new treatments are going to be very interesting, exciting. We're going to hear more about them, I'm sure, from Dr. Keating and Dr. Halleck. Um, but um, it is, it, it's a financial, it's going to be a tremendous financial burden. It's something we're going to have to sort of uh, think about uh, as a community of, of, of how we're going to manage this.